I'm here today with Carol Bismakowitz, the Assistant Inspector General and Chief Data Officer for HHS's Office of Inspector General. And Carol, I'd like to dive right in and talk a little bit about how data is being used today in the OIG, how it's being used to advance investigations and audits. We use he data heavily within our office to support both investigations and audits. We will look at data to see if allegations, a complainant that has come in, it's actually a real uh, complainant if there's evidence that will support a case. We use it to target audits. We look for aberrant behavior for providers or physicians uh, or pharmacies. We look for questionable billing. Uh, all of those things, we leverage heavily the data environments that we have. When we're talking about data, we have a lot of medical claims data to look at. Um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid have about a petabyte's worth of information. If you think about that in your home computer, right, you have a gigabyte, a terabyte, it's a petabyte. That's the next step. It's a lot of information to try to come through. But that's how we use the information. It's combined heavily as well with our field intelligence. So it's not just the data. There's two ways we use it, one in a proactive sense of how might we identify some of this potentially fraudulent billing that would suggest, hey, we might want to apply a little bit more scrutiny and take a second look. Um, or it can be that an investigator will come to our analytics team and say, hey, we, we suspect something's going on. Can you look at the data? That makes a lot of sense. Now, what kind of resources do you have here at the OIG to perform data analysis? What, how large is the team? Um, what kind of funding do you have? That's a great question. So we have uh, three analytics teams throughout the OIG that are really dedicated to analytics full-time, advanced analytics, and one of them is in support of the investigators, uh, one's in support of our auditors, and one's in support of our evaluators, to think of it that way. Those are about 40 people that are really think about the data scientists, data analysts, statisticians, um, and, and evaluators and auditors. There's also a larger analytic community here, though, of folks that will do analytics work as well that are really proficient in the data, and that's at least 100 people that we have that actually connect to our own data warehouse. So if they have questions too about, I, I have a suspect, you know, uh, I suspect that there's some kind of fraud, I want to connect to the data, they can do so themselves, which is really powerful. So it's an exciting time for us right now to figure out how do we leverage the resources we have most effectively to try to answer these questions quickly. Now, could you walk me through just a typical instance of how, say, an OIG audit or investigation uses data analytics or data mining? Sure. So I mentioned this briefly a minute ago, but if an investigator suspects something or if they're in their, in their local area, they think, hey, there's this really, there's a provider that we're just not sure about, or if they've had a whistleblower complaint or something else, they'll come to the analytics team and say, can you please help me understand what's going on in the claims data? So we've actually created a lot of tools to help support this work. One of them is called just a peer comparison generator. If I have a physician in an area that they suspect is doing a lot of toenail removals, for example, and I want to know, is that usual? Is it not usual? What's going on? They can very rapidly um, take a look at the information, do that peer comparison generator, see how much they are an outlier. So when you hear about that from a statistical sense, are they an outlier or not? What does it really look like in the area? When they, the Analysts work very closely with the investigators to really understand what are the claims types that they're looking at, kind of what, what are those diagnostic codes that they suspect might be in a fraud scheme. They'll have lots of conversations. That data is either used for a search affidavit, potentially. It can be used in a grand jury, or it can be used when they get very specific provider and beneficiary information to be used in their investigation itself when they're interviewing witnesses that they have all that information at their fingertips. Now, how do you collect the data? Do you tap into various federal government databases? Uh, how do you kind of put together all this material that then is accessible to, say, investigators? So that's a great question, too. We have connections to CMS's environment that we leverage heavily if we want to have real-time data or as real-time data as we can get. We try to be as efficient as we can and leverage that data source. So we have our data analysts, when I mentioned that dedicated team, that really know how to program in that environment, but it's a really complex environment. It's a lot of data. So what we try to do is pull from that information create tools then that other folks that maybe aren't as technical with the programming side can still have access to that information. Something else that we're really working towards is how do we help people see the information in a way that's meaningful to them. So I you know, joke with my own mom that you know, if you're trying to figure out if you're going to go to school the next day, you look on a weather map. We are like hardwired to look at geospatial information in a very powerful way. So if I'm also looking in a specific area of where my hot spots of activity, if we can take the same information instead of putting it in Excel, chart, an Excel table that people might not understand all the rows and columns because the data just doesn't show, as soon as you put it on a map, it becomes a very powerful image where people can understand, yep, 
why are people traveling? Why, why is some kind of beneficiary traveling five miles to get to a pharmacy in New York when they could have passed 50 pharmacies along the way? What's going on there? Let's understand that. So putting on a map is a very powerful way of understanding the information. And it certainly sounds that the data is a priority of the OIGs. Do you expect the dedicated team to grow? Are you expanding your use of data? Any kind of big plans on the horizon? Absolutely. So first, I, I am our first chief data officer. So I came about a year ago. So even that, I think, was pretty significant to how do we, how do we better leverage the data we have. I'm really here to help accelerate the things that are already happening. Um, so we are growing a bit. Uh, we're trying to figure out what are the smart investments to get other tools in here. So what we talk about is how broad and complex health and human services portfolio really is. So how do we help get more tools and data? You'll hear the phrase democratizing data in this community a lot. And it really is how do we empower more people to look at the data? So we are growing the advanced analytic teams a bit, but we're really trying to be smart about what are those tools and capabilities that are going to enable all of our investigators, evaluators, and auditors to take a look at the data another way. Kind of a wrap-up question. I know that anytime you have a big change in an organization, kind of prioritizing data, for example, there's sometimes pushback. Sometimes the culture of the organization is resistant. Sometimes people don't really understand the, the uses of, say, data analytics. Have you experienced any of that at the OIG, and, and how do you kind of expect to overcome any, any obstacles or any cultural uh, shifts? From my perspective, I don't think there's resistance to wanting to use data, so I'm trying to keep up with the demand. I will say that the challenges are really how do we get the right tools into the right hands at the right time. So I mentioned that CMS data environment is very complex, and so maintaining proficiency in all of the, the relationships of the tables, it really should be a dedicated data analyst that's looking at that long term. If somebody's doing an audit, we want them to focus mostly on the audit and not have to try to maintain that proficiency in the data, but there's a blend there. And so for me, the hurdle is really understanding how do we get the right tools in the right place to support that data science work that's creating the predictive modeling, that's trying to understand target development, and how do we help get people to see the potential areas that they need to look further, while also enabling our other really talented folks to have access to the data. Uh, some of the other things that I talk about, I think about our our newer hires, the millennials, tend to be more data natives. And so really enabling an environment that they can play in the information, they can play in the data, having quality data that's timely, that's really my priority goal. Thanks so much, Carol. It's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.